Biology 160 Introduction to Anatomy and Physiology, the Cardiovascular System. In this last section, I want to mention a few special instances, special examples of circulation that are happening in the body, as well as the movement between capillaries and cells. Now, in general, the blood follows a pathway we've talked about from arteries to capillaries to veins, or arteries to arterioles to capillaries to venules to veins. But there's a few special circumstances that happen that I want to mention. The first one is in the brain. Now for the brain, the the blood moving to the brain is very, very important. So much so that the brain, you never shut off, you never vasoconstrict the, the vessels moving to the brain. So we talked about already how vas vasoconstriction can happen to cause blood pressure to rise, to to affect the amount of blood pressure, but also where that blood is moving and how the capillaries can be sh be shunted to um, shut off different organs and things like that. The brain is very hu hungry for oxygen, for, for the nutrients, for the glucose, and if the brain ever has blood shut off for more than if just, a, I mean, just a minute um, or so, you're going to start to have problems. And once you get up to around four minutes without any blood going to the brain, your brain's going to start dying and, and shutting down and things like that. So it's very, it's very um, selfish is what I'm looking for. It's very selfish with the flow of blood to the brain. And, and the brain may shut off blood to all other parts of the body it wants to, except for the heart. So the, the heart, because it's fed directly after the blood comes out of the, the heart, the heart gets blood. But besides that, the brain can shut off um, the blood to most other parts of the body. But the main arteries that are that are feeding the brain are the um, are the carotid arteries which are coming directly off of the aorta and then also the vertebral vertebral artery and you can see the vertebral artery here is coming in at the base of the of the brain here towards near the vertebral column the the stem the brain stem and the carotid arteries are coming up they're coming through the temporal bone and then entering the brain that way. But the thing I want to point out here, and there's a number of arteries here that you can look at that are that are feeding the different parts of the brain. See the temporal lobe here, this is the front of the brain, the frontal lobe. Here, this is the back of the brain, here's our cerebellum. Back here it's having blood flowing to it. So there's all these arteries, but the ones I want the ones I want to point out, and I'm going to draw them in different colors so you can see, is this this right here called the circle of Willis. So because oxygen, because the blood flowing to the brain is so important, we have this circle of Willis that is developed that allows the the brain to be fed from more, more than one direction. And what that means is, so the blood is coming from here, it's moving into the circle of Willis, also from the carotid arteries, all of them are dumping into this, this circle of Willis, or they're becoming a part of the circle of Willis before they're moving to other parts of the of the brain. So what this means oops <laughs> one second didn't mean to do that there we go so what this means is that if the blood is coming into the brain let's say that you get a clot and it's shut off um, this part here so the brain it can still get the blood because of this circle of Willis. It has a different pathway. It can still follow, follow and get to all those parts of the brain. So it's it's kind of a defense mechanism here that allows our our brain to get the blood it needs, even if part of it's being shut off. This doesn't mean, of course, that you can't have a stroke because we know that people do. So there can still be blockages happening. For example, if you get a clot that forms up here, there's no the, the, this is already past the circle of Willis. So there's nothing really we can the, that's going to help that, and and this part of the brain's going to be going to lose its blood supply and it can start to die. But if it happens before this circle of Willis or within, then we have this allows to kind of redundancy of circulation, so we're still able to get all the blood where it needs to go. So an interesting adaptation there that we have in the brain. The next one I want to point out is the fetus circulation. Now the fetus is is, is an interesting situation because the 
lungs are not functional. So the brain, the fetus is not getting any um, oxygen or or anything from itself. It's all coming from the mother, and that's coming through by means of the placenta and then the umbilical cord that connects the fetus to that placenta. So the the umbilical cord has three vessels. It has one umbilical vein. And the reason it's called a vein is because it's going away from, it's going, so it's going to the, the heart of the fetus. But notice here, here's our second exception we've talked about. So that we've talked about the pulmonary arteries versus veins and how the pulmonary arteries are deoxygenated, the pulmonary veins are oxygenated. Here's our second situation here. The umbilical vein, even though it's called a vein, it is carrying oxygen-rich blood because it's coming from the placenta. This oxygen-rich blood is coming, the oxygen is coming from the mother, it's being carried in the blood, and it's moving into the, the fetus. But because it's moving towards the fetus's um, heart, it's called the umbilical vein. The umbilical arteries, and there are two of them in the umbilical cord, are deoxygenated. So they're carrying carbon dioxide and, and waste products and things like that back from the fetus to the placenta. So here's a picture here. You can see the placenta here, and that's going to be the fetus connection with the mother. And so the this is where the gas exchange happens. You can see here the umbilical vein, the big long, the red thick vessel there, and the umbilical arteries moving away from the fetus's heart back into the umbilical cord. So what happens is the umbil umbilical vein comes from the placenta and it moves towards the the heart of the fetus and it's going to dump into the vena cava which will dump into the right atrium. It bypasses the um, the liver. So the liver isn't very developed yet and so it doesn't go through the liver. The lungs are also not functioning and so there's no real reason for the blood to go to the lungs and so very little blood goes to those lungs and the way this happens here is the the baby is able to move the, to keep the blood from going to those. It bypasses the liver and then also bypasses the the lungs. And so as it's moving through, um, it goes through the ductus venosus to the inferior vena cava into the, and dumps right into the right atrium of heart. And that's oxygenated blood. Then in, as it goes to the, to the right ventricle, instead of going to directly to the, to the, to the lungs and back, there's a couple ways that it can get by bypass the lungs. The first is that some of the blood in the right atrium, as it dumps into the right atrium from the umbilical vein, it goes directly into the left atrium through this, it's basically a hole in the wall of the, um, in, the, of the in the heart that allows the blood to move from the left, uh, from the right to the left atrium and bypass the, the lungs. And then there's also as it's leaving um, the heart, instead of going through the lungs, it can go from the pulmonary um, arteries directly to the aorta and then go through the go to the body. And this is called the ductus arteriosus. And basically, it's a connection between the pulmonary trunk and the aorta. And this continues while the fetus is growing. By the time the fetus is born, you don't want these holes to remain anymore. And so this, um, the shunt between the, the atriums, the foramen ov ov uh, ovale, shuts, it seals off, so we no longer have that hole. And then the ductus arteriosus becomes a ligamentum arteriosum by the time you're born. And so it's these ligaments, and I'll show you here in a second, uh, where this is found, these these are ligaments that are connecting the the aorta and the pulmonary artery. In some cases, these remain open. So there are some children that are born with uh, these holes haven't totally gone away, and this causes problems in the in the heart function, obviously, because you're going to have redundancy. You're going to have oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood mixing with each other and things like that. So your heart's going to have to work harder. And so, um, but surgeries, you can go in with surgeries and fix these, these problems so it doesn't affect the, the child. So let's look at these two places here. So you can see the foramen ovale here. So it's coming in the umbilical vein, dumping into the right atrium. Instead of going to the left, uh, left atrium, 
I mean, to the right ventricle, sorry, it can move through the foramen ovale into the left atrium and from there into the left ventricle and then it get pumped around the body. If it gets into, if the blood goes into the um, right ventricle, it'll start to pump to the pulmonary arteries to go to the lungs, but instead of going clear to the lungs, some most, most of that blood or some of that blood will go through the ductus arteriosus here and go straight into the aorta from where it can be pumped out into the, the body. And then once it's pumped out into the body, instead of going back into the heart, it's going to go through these umbilical arteries to the placenta and this whole system is going to continue. So very interesting um, system that we have in the fetal circulation. The last one is what's called the hepatic portal circulation. And this is a, an interesting situation where we have a special system just that's happening with the, um, the liver. So normally, normally when we have blood vessels, we go from arteries to capillaries to veins, or arterials to capillaries to venules. Um, but in this case, we have a hepatic portal system. In the hepatic portal system, what we have is a situation where we're going from arteries here to capillaries, a capillary bed, and then to a vein. But then instead of then going back into the heart, going into the vena cava, we have a second capillary bed that's found in the liver before moving into the, um, the vein that's going to take it back to the inferior vena cava, dump into the inferior vena cava. So we have these two capillary beds, one after the other. And what, what this hap why this happens, or what's going on here, we have these veins in the hepatic portal circulation, and they are draining the digestive organs, the spleen and the pancreas. Oop, I'm running out of battery here. So they're, gonna, they're going to empty these uh, systems here. And the reason this is, is because the digestive organs, they're receiving all the nutrients from the food that's being digested. So they're pulling all these nutrients into the blood. Instead of having that blood circulate clear around the body before getting to the liver, it goes directly to the liver. The liver is the one that takes care of all the glucose, the fat. It's, it's the one that um, maintains those concentrations in the blood. So by going from directly from the digestive system to the liver, it can pull all that stuff out of the blood so it doesn't have to circulate clear around the body. Um, as it's moving around. So we have the arteries coming to the, the capillaries and these are in the digestive system and they're absorbing all these nutrients. And then from there we're moving into the hepatic portal vein which will then take it to the liver and in the liver all these nutrients and everything are going to be pulled out of the circulation. The glucose to maintain the right uh, blood levels, the, the proteins, the, the ions, everything is going to be pulled out so that the blood maintains those levels that it needs and then the liver can use all those um, nutrients and everything to, to do its work. And then it's going to move into the hepatic vein and then into the, the vein and move throughout the body. And here you can see this in this picture here, you can see how all the, um, so here's the, the intestines here, you can see all the the veins draining all these intestines, they're picking up all these nutrients, um, and then they're, and then also the spleen, and these are all dumping into this hep hepatic portal vein here. So all of these blue veins are dumping into this hepatic portal vein, moving into the liver, and then from the liver, we're then going to dump into the, the vena cava, so we're able to make that connection there. So this is a, another one of the circulations that we have, special circulation. The last thing I want to mention here is, is capillary exchange. So the capillaries are where the exchange with the cells actually takes place. And so that's where oxygen and nutrients are going to be leaving the blood. The blood's going to be picking up carbon dioxide and other waste and taking them away from the cells. And so the capillaries are very important in this exchange. And the way this exchange happens is dependent on two things. One is the blood pressure, and the other is the osmotic pressure. The blood pressure is caused by the beating of the heart. So the heart is pumping it's actively pushing the blood around the body and so on the arterial side of the circulation there's a lot of blood pressure on the venous side there's not because by the time it gets to the venous side all that pr the pressure from the heart pumping has basically gone away osmotic pressure on the other hand is determined by the the fluids the concentrations of ions and the fluid balance within the capillaries so as we look at this capillary here this picture is showing a picture of a capillary 
and you can see the blood is flowing, the red blood cells are flowing along the capillary. On the left side we have the arterial side, on the right side we have the venous side. Now as the the blood is pumping through these capillaries, it's coming from the arterial side, the um, pressure is high, and so what that means is that because there's a high arterial pressure, it's going to going to push that fluid out to the, what we call the interstitial space around the, the cells. The blood cells don't leave, but a lot of the fluid does. Then as it continues to travel along and gets to the venous side, the blood pressure drops, and now the blood pressure is going to be outweighed by what we call the osmotic pressure. So the osmotic pressure is constant, as you can see in this lower picture here. The osmotic pressure is constant. It doesn't change. The blood pressure does. And when the blood pressure is higher than the osmotic pressure, that is going to cause fluids to leave the capillaries and go into interstitial space. And then, then the exchange can happen. The nutrients, the oxygen can be exchanged and given to the cells. Then on the venous side, the osmotic pressure is still the same, but now the blood pressure is just dropped below that pressure. So now fluids are going to be coming back into the blood along its osmotic gradient. And that's going to allow the CO2 to come back in, allow it to pick up the waste from the cells as it's moving um, along, along this pathway. And so this is the capillary exchange that is occurring here. This picture here actually shows a picture of the capillary and shows somehow the, some of the mechanisms that cause the exchange to happen. And, and I want to show you this because this connect, connects what, with what we talked about a lot. It's been a while since we talked about exchanges, but this will help connect why that was important, I guess. So, a while back we talked about simple diffusion, we talked about active and passive transport, active tra transport taking energy to cause things to happen. We also talked about passive transport. We talked about how oxygen crosses a membrane using passive transport, and CO2 does as well, coming back in. So that's what happens in this capillary exchange here. Oxygen and CO2, they can diffuse along their concentration gradients from the inside of the capillary where the oxygen is high because it's coming from the heart and from the lungs. It's going to diffuse out into the interstitial space, interstitial fluid, then into the cells along its concentration gradient. CO2 is coming back from the cells and it's going back into the capillaries where it's going to be taken to the lungs and exhaled. So, Oxygen and CO2 move in and out of the capillaries in our cells simply through this method of diffusion, following their concentration gradient. Other things, we also have a diffusion that is uh, facilitated diffusion, meaning that ions and things like that need to move across, but they can't move through by themselves, and so they have to use this intercellular cleft. We also have vesicles over here that are being used, and vesicles are moving. Um, they are in a type of active transport, but this is when we're mo moving large packages of things across the membrane, across these cells of the capillaries. And so these vesicles are going to move through these cells using active transport. You can see all, how all these different types of transport come into play. I also want to talk just briefly about devel developmental aspects. So a cardiovascular system begins developing very early. So within the fourth week of development, within the womb, we already have a beating heart even though it's just basically a tube at that point, but then it continues to grow and develop into a four-chambered heart by the end of seven weeks. And from there, it's, it's ready to go, and, and the only changes that really happen are, are growth um, over time, but our, it's able to keep beating throughout our life. Um, there are some things that, that happen over time as we age as well, and one is that the valves and the veins start to weaken and can lead to things like varicose veins, a decreased circulation. We get um, atherosclerosis, which is the buildup of plaque within our vessels that happen and can eventually lead to blockages or clotting or um, a lot of different things. Those can lead to stroke or heart failure. Also have um, a loss of elasticity of the vessels. Happens as we get older. We have coronary heart disease as the vessels continue to, fat, uh, to fill up with plaque. And so there's a lot of things that can happen as we get older. But in general, our cardiovascular system is pretty amazing how it's able to work throughout our life.